Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Covenator here wishing everyone out there a happy 4th of July. It's not quite the 4th of July yet at the time of this recording, but uh, in a few days it will be, so hope everyone has a wonderful 4th. This is the second tutorial in the series. If you happen to miss the first, I highly recommend you go and watch it, as it focuses on the interesting story behind the A-10, how it was conceived and how it was involved in what it is today. I'll make sure to have a link to that video in the description below. This tutorial is going to focus on the design of the A-10, and we're going to cover every inch of this aircraft, starting with the nose going all the way to the tail. The only exception is the cockpit, which we will cover in depth in the next video. In this tutorial, we're going to be taking a close look at the core design, flight characteristics, and all the weapons that the A-10 can employ. And by the end, you'll see that the A-10 is pretty unique. In fact, it's the only aircraft in the Air Force that was specifically designed for close air support. So we got a lot of ground to cover. Let's get to it. The A-10C is a fixed-wing, single-pilot aircraft. From the ground up, it was designed to be the most survivable and deadly close air support aircraft in the skies. Starting with the nose of the fuselage is the GAL-8 A Avenger 30mm Gatlin-type cannon. And although the A-10 can carry a considerable amount of weaponry, it's the cannon alone that instills fear into its enemies, leaving a long-lasting psychological impact on the battlefield. It was pretty much a given in the A-10's design. In fact, it's better said that the aircraft was actually designed around the gun. During the AX competition when the A-10 was being designed, the decision to make the gun the primary anti-tank weapon was based on a book, Stuka Pilot, by Hans Jorik Riedel. And in case you're wondering who that guy was, he was the highest German decorated officer in the Second World War. Riedel flew the Ju-87G Stuka for the Luftwaffe and destroyed many Soviet tanks using its two underwing BK 37mm anti-tank autocannons. With over 3,500 combat missions flown and a number of successes, he remains unbeaten in all times and all nations. The book was pretty much required reading for the entire AX team. The GAL 8 A Avenger fires large depleted uranium armor piercing shells. In the original design, the pilot could switch between two rates of fire. 2100 or 4200 rounds per minute. However, this was later changed to a fixed rate of 3900 rounds per minute, with the pilot being able to choose from a variety of round types, with the most common being combat mix consisting of armor piercing rounds mixed with high explosive incendiary rounds. It takes the cannon about a half second to come up to speed, so 50 rounds are fired during the first second, 65 70 rounds per second thereafter, and while the firing generates about 10,000 pounds of recoil, the flight control system keeps the gun accurate, enough to place 80% of its shots within a 40 foot diameter circle from about 4,000 feet away. While the gun barrel only sticks out a little from the nose, the entire gun is actually over 5 feet long, extending underneath the cockpit along the aircraft's centerline. It weighs in at about 4,200 pounds, or about as much as, as an average sized car, and is so massive that it forces the front landing gear to be mounted off to the side of the fuselage. It turned out it was actually a pretty smart design decision, allowing the gun to be in the center for increased accuracy, with the cockpit sitting high over the center of the gun for excellent visibility over the, the, the nose. Above the gun is the cockpit itself, which is protected by a bulletproof plexiglass canopy and houses a 0 ejection seat along with the various cockpit controls and instrumentation. We'll be taking an in-depth look at the cockpit and the controls in the next tutorial. Protecting the cockpit and the pilot, of course, is 1,200 pounds of titanium, referred to as the bathtub, allowing the A-10 to absorb a significant amount of damage from armor-piercing rounds as well as high explosive projectiles. By the way, in case you're wondering what the zero zero part of the ejection seat means, it basically stands for zero altitude, zero airspeed. It is designed to safely eject its occupant from a grounded stationary position using small rockets to propel the pilot to an adequate altitude, where explosive charge is used to deploy a parachute quickly to see the pilot safely to the ground. 
With the A-10 being a close air support aircraft flying at very low speeds and altitudes, having this type of ejection seat is crucial. It's just amazing that that works from the ground. Moving on to the center section of the fuselage contains the forward and aft fuselage fuel tanks, which are the main fuel tanks of the aircraft which are covered with a fire retardant material and are self-sealing should any of them become compromised. And moving outward from the center of the aircraft are, of course, the wings, which are low mounted and straight, giving the aircraft excellent maneuverability and a very low stall speed. The wing design does cause the A-10 to be a bit of a slowpoke compared to other fighter aircraft, but allows the A-10 the ability to loiter over the battlefield, staying in a small assigned target area with a high level of endurance. And at the base of the wings are additional fuel tanks, one for the left and one for the right, and as the main uh, fuselage tanks, they are also self-sealing and filled with a flexible foam to prevent explosion. Additional fuel tanks can be mounted underneath the wings, but do not have this level of protection, so they are generally just used in ferry flights and never used in combat. On the side trailing edge of the wings themselves are the flaps. Uh, the flaps are powered by the hydraulics, are divided into two outer and inner wings, which all raise and lower simultaneously. At each of the wing tips are the two ailerons, and the ailerons allow the aircraft to roll. In addition to the primary function of imparting roll control to the aircraft, each aileron can also split vertically to form a speed brake. The ailerons are powered by either hydraulic should one of them fail. If both hydraulics fail, the ailerons are further backed up by a push rod and linkage system called the Manual Reversion Flight Control System. So if one of the ailerons should get jammed, there is an emergency disconnect switch to free it. Underneath each wing and extending forward, left and right, are the wheel wells. The two main gears are partially covered by the wells and the gear retract forward into them. The forward end of the left wheel housing contains the single point refueling receptacle. The corresponding right wheel well end is colored black and houses the IFF receiver which is used to identify other aircraft as friend or foe. Under the wings are 11 weapon stations, and the weapon stations support two different rack types, a single ejector rack to hold a single weapon, and a triple ejector rack to hold three. While the single ejector rack can be installed on any station, the triple rack can only be installed on certain stations. Which one you use for a given station depends on what kind of munitions you want to use. And speaking of munitions, the A-10 can employ a variety of weapons. From inexpensive unguided to laser guided bombs, the A-10 can employ a wide variety. It even supports inertially aided munitions with GPS, INS, or JDAM guidance kits. How these munitions actually work and how they are employed on the A-10 is actually a fairly complex subject which will be covered in future videos. In fact, I will probably do a separate video for each one. For now though, I'll briefly just go over the overview of all the weapons that the A-10 can employ. First up, we have the Hydra 70 Unguided Folding Fin Aerial Rockets. These are an area of effect weapon and are certainly not used for a precision attack. Most of the time this kind of weapon is used for suppression. The rockets are fired from a 7-tube launcher pod and as you would imagine there are several different rocket warhead types. There are high explosive warheads like the Mark V, inert warheads for training, as well as smoke warheads used for markers and even parachute flares used for illumination over the battlefield. Next up, we have a variety of unguided bombs, and these basically fall into three basic categories. Training, general purpose, and cluster. As you probably guessed, training have inert warheads, and general purpose bombs like the Mark 82 and the Mark 84, and cluster bombs like the CBU-87 and the CBU-97 can be used for a variety of targets, ranging from unarmored to heavy armor types. Next up we have the laser guided bombs like the GBU-10 and the GBU-12. Laser designation can originate from the A-10 or another aircraft or ground unit. 
doesn't matter if the target is moving as the bomb senses the reflective energy given off by the laser and can correct its flight to the target. And while lasers can follow the target, they are susceptible to clouds and, and bad weather. Next up, we have the inertially aided munitions like the GBU-31 and the GBU-38. These type of munitions use a variety of guiding kits like GPS, INS, or JDAM. In simple terms, coordinates supplied by the A-10 are downloaded into the guidance system of the bomb and once released, the bomb can correct its flight path to the target. Although these weapons are useful against static targets, um, they are pretty much useless against moving ones. However, the fact that they are using a coordinate system pretty much means that they can strike targets through any kind of weather. Next up, we have the AGM-65 Maverick, which are actually one of my personal favorites. It's a precision-guided, standoff, air-to-ground missile that has an imaging or optical seeker that's installed directly in the head of the missile to track its target. And because of this, the Maverick is a true fire-and-forget weapon. Once you've launched it, there's no need to guide the weapon. Um, there are several Maverick versions, as you can imagine, but overall, because of their fire-and-forget nature, they're best used to eliminate air defense units. And speaking of air, we have the AIM-9 Sidewinder. And while the A-10 was not designed for air-to-air -air combat, it does have this capability with both the AIM-9 missile and with the 30mm gun in air-to-air -air mode. The missile has an infrared detector and the nose of the missile to track infrared energy of targets. Last but not least, we have the ANAAQ-28 Lightning Targeted Pod. It is a powerful device used to track targets on the ground or in the air. Using a sophisticated CCD camera combined with an infrared camera, it is also able to track targets day and night. It also has a built-in laser designation and ranging system, so you can use it to drop a laser-guided bomb, or can use it to laser a target for another aircraft. And because of its sight range, it's best used above 10,000 feet. Well, that sums it up for all of the various weapons that you can employ on the A-10. Moving on, behind the wings in the aft portion of the fuselage contains the mounting points for the rudder and elevator control surface assemblies, as well as the right and left hydraulic system. Also, in the aft portion of the fuselage is the auxiliary power unit, or APU. If you're wondering what the APU is, it's actually a small turbine that is used to provide auxiliary electrical power to the aircraft as well as start the main engines. For the main engines we have the A-10C uh, twin TF-34GE 100A engines that are mounted high on the rear fuselage between the wings and the rear stabilizers. The unusual placement reduces the chance that the engines could ingest foreign debris also reduces the infrared signature of the aircraft due to the shielding of the horizontal stabilizer. Also, the engines are mounted high, meaning that on the ground the engines can remain running while the aircraft is refueled or rearmed, leading to faster mission turnaround. At maximum thrust, each engine produces about 9,000 pounds of thrust. And there is no afterburner, and while it's true that the A-10 is no speed demon, the engines are reliable, fuel economic, and durable in their current form. Moving on to the rear of the aircraft are the elevators. The two elevators are attached using a shearable crossover shaft that can be disconnected if one of the elevators become jammed. This is done by using an elevator emergency disconnect switch, and this will allow the other elevator to operate but with less pitch authority. Like the ailerons, each elevator is powered by either hydraulic, and should one fail, um, the, the other one would take over, and if both hydraulics fail, the manual reversion flight control system allows control to be shifted from hydraulics to mechanical push rods and cables. Yaw control is provided by two rudders, and each rudder is also powered by several hydraulics, should one fail and are in turn connected to the rudder pedal pedals via a cable and linkage system should both hydraulics fail. But unlike the elevators and the ailerons, there is no emergency disconnect option if one were to get jammed. 
So overall, you can see that with the hydraulics uh, combined with the push rod and cable system, the A-10 is not by any means a fly-by-wire fly aircraft like, uh, for example, the F-16. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't have a sophisticated flight control system. The A-10 uses a stability augmentation system called SAS. Uh, that's what it stands for, Stability Augmentation System. It basically feeds pitch and yaw input to provide better and finer control. And this results in better target tracking and reduces the amount of trimming that's needed. The A-10 also has an Enhanced Attitude Control System, or EAC. This system uses sensor data from the embedded GPS INS navigation system to provide autopilot functions to the aircraft through SAS. It also uh, provides precision attitude control when firing the gun on the A-10. That's needed for that 10,000 pound recoil. The flight control system combined with the hydraulics and the cable push rod system provides a good stable weapons platform to accurately employ weapons from and is very much a seat of your pants aircraft to fly. It can be extremely responsive in the right hands. Altogether, the A-10 is an exceptionally survivable aircraft with excellent pilot protection, with its strong airframe, to its triple redundancy and its flight systems. To put it in perspective, with all of the redundancy involved, the aircraft could fly with one engine, one tail, one elevator, and half a wing blown off, and still make it back to friendly airspace. And with all the high-tech uh, control systems in place, the variety of modern-day weapons that the A-10 can employ, and let's not forget that B.A. Brock is cannon on the front, there's nothing in the skies that even comes close to what the A-10 can do for close air support. Well, that wraps it up for this tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it, or at least have found it to be informative. If you like what you've seen and you want to see more, uh, please take a moment to like and subscribe. It really does mean a lot, and it motivates me to continue the series. Anyways, guys, happy flying out there. Happy 4th of July. And thanks so much for watching. This is The Covenator, signing off.